Today we continue our discussion of chapter 19. This is our third and last lecture on this chapter. And let's review the material that we have covered so far in the last two lectures. We started this chapter with some basic definitions like Avogadro's number, moles, molecules, their masses and numbers. And then we stated and discussed the ideal gas law. In particular, we discussed the isothermal process for an ideal gas and found the work done in that process. Then in the last lecture, we discussed and derived in detail the RMS speed, root mean square speed of gas molecules, which is a kind of average speed uh, of gas molecules. It will give us an idea, a number of what is the speed of gas molecules as uh, at a certain temperature. So it is a function of temperature only. Based on that, we calculated the average translational kinetic energy for one molecule, and we saw that it is equal to 3 half kT. This is a number that is close to 10 to the minus 21 joules. For one gas molecule, it only depends on the temperature, uh, but it is the same for all gas molecules, no matter what the gas is. Let's remember that a gas molecule can perform three types of uh, motions. The first one is translation, where the molecule as a whole moves as a unit. The second one is rotation, where uh, this, is, uh, this is for polyatomic molecules, diatomic, triatomic, and so on. The atoms of the molecule can rotate about a certain axis. They can also oscillate about their center of mass. So we have these three types of motions that can be executed by a gas molecule. We focused our attention on monoatomic gases, gases for which the molecule contains only one atom, and these are basically the noble gases that we have here. Now, for, for such gases, we can only have translational motion because the other types of motion, you need at least two atoms to do it. So if in monoatomic gases you have one atom, then you can only talk about translational motion. So we discussed monoatomic ideal gases, and we found that the internal energy of such a gas is equal to 3 half in RT. Again, it is a function of temperature only. Now we will build on this knowledge. We will use this equation that we derived in the last lecture to find the molar specific heats of an ideal gas. And if we have these quantities, we can describe any process related to an ideal gas. So today we have basically two topics. The first one is to derive the molar specific heats of an ideal gas. And then we will consider the adiabatic process as it applies to an ideal gas. And we will also briefly talk about free expansion. So let's talk about the first topic, which is the molar specific heats of an ideal gas. Let's remember what we did in chapter 18 with regard to solids and liquids. We saw that if a process is accompanied by a change in temperature, then the amount of heat in that process is equal to mc delta t, the mass of the object, specific heat of the material from which the object is made times the change in temperature. We have also indicated that the molar specific heats in solids and liquids do not depend on how they are determined, whether you measure them under constant volume or under constant pressure, they are almost the same. For gases, it's a totally different story. These two quantities will not be the same as we will see now. So let's continue our discussion of section seven, which we started uh, in the last lecture. We derived the internal energy for an ideal monoatomic gas. Now we will use that to derive the molar specific heats. And we will start with a process that takes place at constant volume, the isochoric process. So for that, we consider a monoatomic ideal gas of n moles having pressure P and temperature T 
confined to a cylinder of fixed volume. Here is the cylinder. It is fitted with a pistol. But the pistol, as you can see, is pinned, is fixed, is screwed in place. So it will not go up or down. And therefore, the volume of the gas is fixed. Whatever happens, it will happen at constant volume. So here we are talking about an isochoric process. Suppose now that you add a small amount of heat to the gas. So the, the whole cylinder is sitting on a thermal reservoir on a stove, mauqid. So you can control the uh, temperature of the reservoir and by that you can get heat into or out of the gas. Let's say that we raise the temperature of the reservoir so heat gets into the gas but the gas again is under constant volume. So because of that added heat to the gas the temperature will increase and the gas moves to a new state. Here is the situation on a PV diagram. This is the initial state of the gas before we add any heat. It has some volume B initial and some pressure P initial. We increase the temperature of the gas. So the gas will move on this line, okay? The volume is fixed. So it will only move vertically. This is the initial state. So the final state will be that state in here, which is, which is moved to because of the added heat to the gas. With this now, we want to calculate the molar specific heat of an ideal gas at constant volume because this process takes place at constant volume. So here is the process that we are considering now. Okay, so like we said, we are in section 19.7. And today we will start with, with the molar specific heat at constant volume. We described the process. Now let's do the calculations. Now similar to the, uh, the solids and liquids, we said that the amount of heat added or lost in a process is equal to mc times delta t. Now we have the same, basically the same equation, but instead of the mass, we will use the number of moles, and instead of the specific heat, we will use the molar specific heat. So the amount of heat added in this process, the amount of heat added that will cause this transition is equal to, like this one, it will be equal to NCV multiplied by dt. We already know that the work done in this process is zero, and that's because the volume is constant. There is no change in volume, so the work done is zero. What about the internal energy? In the last lecture, we saw that the internal energy for an ideal monoatomic gas is in uh, in sorry three half n r delta t uh, t so the change in internal energy delta e internal take the differential of this equation it will be three over two n r delta t now we have the three quantities that we need to apply the first law of thermodynamics the first law of thermodynamics says the change in the internal energy in a thermodynamic process is equal to Q minus W. So this is equal to 3 half N R delta T is equal to N C V times delta T. And the work is zero. So let's cancel. N will cancel. Delta T will cancel, and we get our first result. The molar specific heat of an ideal gas at constant volume is equal to 3R over 2. And this is just a number, eight is point, R is 8.31. So you can plug it in here and find that this is 12.5 W.
joule per mole Kelvin. Here is the molar specific heat of an ideal monoatomic gas at constant volume. Now we can use this result to rewrite the equation for the internal energy. 3 half R is equal to CV. So now we can rewrite the equation for the internal energy as E internal is equal to NCV multiplied by T. From which you can see that delta E internal in any thermodynamic process is NCV multiplied by delta T. And since the internal energy is an intrinsic property that depends only on the initial and final state, uh, sorry, yes, the initial and final state, then this equation would be the same for whatever gas, for whatever process. Even if we go to a different process like isobaric or adiabatic or isothermal, this equation for the internal energy would be the same because the internal energy only depends on the initial and the final state. So let us stress that this equation that we found here is true for any gas, by any gas we mean monoatomic or diatomic, and any process, not necessarily just CV, for any kind of process. This is the equation that we will use from now on to calculate the internal energy. Let's take example of this, and that is this example here. What we have here is we take the gas from an initial state I to three different final states, okay? They are different, but what is the same for all of them is that they fall on an isotherm, so they all have the same temperature. What can we say about the work? The work is different for each one of them. Here the work is positive, here it is zero, and here it is negative. Likewise, Q for each one of these three processes will be different. But delta E depends only on delta T. Here, the, temperature, the initial temperature is T. The final temperature for all three states is the same. So delta T for all three processes is the same. Since delta T is the same, delta E internal is the same for all three processes. Q is different, W is different, but delta E, because they all follow the same temperature line, delta E internal will be the same for all of them. So this is the first process, the molar specific heat at constant volume. Let's now see what happens if we do the process at constant pressure. So now, assume that the temperature of the gas is increased by the same amount, delta T, but with the gas held at constant pressure P. Okay, so now here is the process. We removed the pins that were here. So the piston now is allowed to move up or down, and therefore the, uh, the volume is, is variable now. It's not fixed like before. But now the pressure is constant. So we are not changing the weight of the lid shot. We are not touching that. So the pressure is constant. What we have here is we again increase the temperature of the thermal reservoir, heat will get into the gas, the gas now can expand. So the volume will change, but the pressure is constant. So it is expansion under constant pressure, and that's an example of an isobaric process. On a PV diagram, the process looks like this. Here is the state I, and the state F will be along this line. This is the line where the pressure is constant. So we keep adding heat. The gas will proceed along this line. When it reaches this point, where is this point? Okay, this point is along this orange line. We want delta T to be the same for both cases, to compare them. So along this orange line, the temperature is the same. We keep increasing the pressure 
until we hit the point on this line. At that point, we know that these are different processes, but delta T is the same for both of them because the initial temperature is the green one, the final temperature is the orange one, okay? Any point on this line will have the same temperature. So we increase the pressure until we hit that point so that delta T is the same for the two processes. And now you can see what is happening with this new process. In the old process, which is what we discussed here, the added heat just increased the internal energy of the gas. With this new process, the added heat will do two things. Increase the internal energy of the gas and do work. Okay, now we have work. In this case, the work was zero. But now we have more energy that will do work. So in the case of expansion, at constant pressure, we need more heat because now we have the added work to do in this process. So with this in mind, let's find what is Cp, which is the molar specific heat at constant pressure. Okay? So to do that, we will go similar to what we did here. What is QV? What is the work? What's the internal energy? And then substitute them into the first law of thermodynamics and find Cp. So this is the second process we have today, which is the molar specific heat at constant pressure. Again, all of this is for a monoatomic gas. We will discuss the diatomic gases later on. So, with this new process described, expansion at constant pressure, what do we have? We start with Q, QP, okay? is just like that, but now we replace this with P. N Cp multiplied by delta T. The internal energy for any process is given by that equation, N Cv times delta T. The work done in the isobaric process, something we derived in chapter 18, is equal to P times delta V. And now bring in our friend. Never forget this friend in chapter 19, the ideal gas law. PV is equal to NRT. Let's take the differential of this equation. Apply the chain rule of calculus. The change of this quantity is P delta V plus V delta P, both are variables. And here in R are constants, so this is in R delta T. In this process, the pressure is constant, so delta P is zero, that is out. P delta V is the work done in this process, so that is equal to in R delta T. Now apply the first law of thermodynamics, Delta E internal is equal to Q minus W. So, NCV delta T is equal to NCP delta T minus NR delta T. Cancel the common things. N will cancel. Delta T will cancel. This is Cp that we are looking for. Take this one there, and you can see that Cp, the molar specific heat at constant pressure, is equal to the molar specific heat at constant volume plus R. So it is more than Cv because of the added work that we have there. It's more by a value of R. Now this process, uh, sorry, this equation is true is true for any ideal gas, be it monoatomic or diatomic. Only thing that would change from one gas to the other one is Cv. So as Cv changes, you will have the change, but then add R to that, you get the value Cp. Finally, here we need to define a quantity, 
called gamma, and gamma is the ratio of CP over CV. CP over CV, and as you can see, by the way, for let's just do it as a special case for a monoatomic gas. <coughs> For a monoatomic gas, <coughs> what is CV? We found it. CV is 3R over 2. So CP is R plus this, that would be 5R over 2. And I think this would be 20.8 for the monoatomic gas. Now, gamma is CP over CV. How much is that for the monoatomic gas? <coughs> you can see that S gamma is CP over CV, which is 5R over 2 times 2 over 3R. The R will cancel, the 2 will cancel, and this is 5 over 3, which is 1.67. That's the value of gamma for a monoatomic gas. Okay? For a diatomic gas, we will see. How much is that? So here we have accomplished what we want to do to find, which is the molar specific heats of an ideal gas. You can indeed see that they are different. Okay? They are different. They differ by R for a given gas. <clears throat> now, let's generalize this discussion to diatomic gases. Okay? All of this was for monoatomic gases. How do we treat diatomic gases? Well, in diatomic gases, <coughs> remember that the molecule can translate, and in addition, it can rotate and vibrate. So there are two extra motions that can be carried out by the molecule. How does that affect CP and CV? Well, each dimension gives one half RT to the internal energy. That is what we have here, okay? What we have here. A molecule, when it translates, it will translate in three dimensions. So three dimensions times one half RT will give us the equation that we have here. This is for translation of motion. So, since E and T is in CVT, that's what we have here, then each dimension gives us one half R to CV. A monoatomic gas has only translational motion in three dimensions, so this is its molar specific heat at constant volume. The three comes from the three dimensions in which the particle can translate. So that's what we have. A diatomic gas, like what we have here, has two extra motions, <coughs> which are rotation and vibration. And therefore, we have the three be as before for X, Y, Z, and now we have two coming from rotation and vibration. Therefore, the molar specific heat of an ideal gas, of an ideal diatomic gas, we have now five instead of three as before, so it will be five R over two. And therefore, we have this table that compares diatomic and monoatomic gases. For a monoatomic gas, CV is 3R over 2. That's what we found here. CP, you just add R to that, so we get 5R over 2. The difference between the two is R. Gamma, the ratio of the two, as we found here, is 1.67. And the internal energy, as we said, is true for any gas any process is in CV multiplied by T. For the diatomic gas, we saw that the 3 becomes 5 because of rotation and vibration. So that is 5R over 2. CP is obtained by adding an R to that. So that is 7R over 2. Again, the difference between the two is just R. The ratio of the two will be 7 over 5 which is 1.4, and again, the internal energy is in CV multiplied by T. So in this way, we have covered in detail the 
uh, molar specific heats of an ideal gas. With this we now move into section 19.9. Please watch, huh? 19.7, now we are moving to 19.9. <coughs> Watch the material that we are skipping uh, in this chapter. Basically, section 19.8, which is what we are skipping between these two, is this line here, okay? So I have summarized it here. In section 19.9, we want to describe or discuss the adiabatic process as it applies to an ideal gas. In chapter 18, we introduced the adiabatic process as a process for which the, the, the heat is equal to zero. No heat is absorbed or lost by the system. That's the general definition of the adiabatic process. Now we want to apply that specifically to ideal gases. For that, we consider again an ideal gas, but now it is in an insulated cylinder. Remember the thermal reservoir that was here? We removed it. Now it is completely insulated. No heat gets into or out of the gas. So we consider an ideal gas in an isolated cylinder. By removing the weight, if we now remove the lead shot, start removing it, the pressure will decrease and the gas will be allowed to expand. But now it is adiabatic expansion because there is no heat getting into or out of the system. So this is expansion because we remove the lead shot, the gas expands, but now it is adiabatic expansion. As it expands, of course the volume increases, the pressure decreases because we are removing the lead shot, so the pressure decreases, and T decreases. The temperature decreases as the gas expands adiabatically. And this is called adiabatic cooling. Now, P is logical. We are removing the lead shot, so definitely P will decrease. As P decreases, the gas expands, logical. Why does the temperature decrease? Now you can see that from the first law of thermodynamics. Delta E internal is equal to Q minus W. For this process, Q is zero. So delta E internal is equal to minus W. The gas is expanding, okay? Expansion, the work is positive. If the work is positive, delta E is negative, okay? Delta E internal will be negative. And delta E internal is related to delta T. These are positive constants. So if delta E is negative, then Delta T will also be negative, and that means the temperature decreases, the gas cools down, okay? So with this, let's now describe the adiabatic process as it applies to an ideal gas. So this is section 19.9 and here we are considering the adiabatic process as it applies to an ideal gas. Now, during an adiabatic process, during, okay, while it is taking place, not at the beginning and at the end. At the beginning and the end, the ideal gas law applies. We are talking about while the process is taking place. During an adiabatic process, the relationship, the relationship, between the pressure and the volume 
S P V to the power gamma. We already explained what is it gamma. It's the ratio of C P over C V is constant. Okay? So while the process is taking place, pressure changes, volume changes, but this product, it's not PV. PV is constant for which process? Do you remember? The isothermal process. Because in the isothermal process, remember PV is equal to NRT. In the isothermal process, T is constant, so PV is constant. Now in this process, it's not PV is constant, it's PV to the power gamma that is constant. I am putting this without derivation. The derivation is, is very nice, really. It depends on the uh, combination of the ideal gas law and the first law of thermodynamics. So I may put this derivation at the end of the lecture for you to see how it goes and how did we get this relationship here. Now, this can be written as P initial, V initial at the power gamma at the beginning of the process is equal to P final, V final to the power gamma. You can, of course, write, use the, the, there is, uh, the ideal gas law to write another relationship between T and V. How do we do that? Let's see. P initial is in R T initial. Okay. Here is P in R T over V. So uh, in R T initial over V initial times V initial to the gamma is equal to N R T final over V final, V final to the gamma. These will cancel T initial, V initial to the gamma minus one is equal to T final, V final to the gamma minus one. So here is another relationship that we can use. T initial, V initial to the power gamma minus one is equal to T final, V final to the gamma minus one. You can, of course, go ahead and write a third relation between T and P, but that will not be as easy as this. So I leave that for you as an exercise. What will be the relation between T and P for an adiabatic process? Now, on a PV diagram, on a PV diagram, if I want to draw or represent the adiabatic process on a PV diagram, the adiabatic process, <coughs> the adiabatic process occurs or takes place on a line or a curve called adiabat, adiabat. The isothermal process occurs on an isotherm, that's the name of the curve. The adiabatic process occurs on a curve called adiabat. So how does it look like? It looks more steeper than the isothermal process. Here is an isothermal process. The orange lines are as the isothermal process that take place at a given temperature. As the temperature is increased, these curves goes, uh, go up. And here is the curve, the green one, is the curve representing an adiabatic process. You can see that it is steeper than the isothermal process. And the reason is very simple math. If you draw y is equal to 1 over x, which is this, this is y, this is x, that will be this green line. For the adiabatic process, the relationship between P and V, you can see that here, it's constant over V to the power gamma. We have seen that gamma is always greater than 1. For the monoatomic gas, gamma is 1.67. For the diatomic, it is equal to 1.4, but it is always greater than 1. So for the adiabatic process, P is equal to a constant, whatever it is, divided by V to the power gamma, and this gamma is more than 1. So you can try that, very simple math. This is 1 over x. This is 1 over x squared. As the exponent of x increases, it goes steeper and steeper downward. And now we are increasing the exponent more than 1, so definitely the adiabatic process is steeper than the corresponding 
isothermal process. Finally, let us remind ourselves about the <coughs> uh, free expansion process. Again, let's describe this one. You have uh, a container that has two compartments. It is totally insulated, totally insulated. And originally, one compartment is filled with the gas, the other one is vacant. There is a stopcock between them. If you open the stopcock, the gas will expand until it fills the whole volume. That's expansion. It's free expansion. Free because as the gas expands, it will not do any work. Okay? Once this is open, it's open. It's not like a, a piston where the gas has to push. So it is free. No work is done. No heat is exchanged. The internal energy will not change from the first law of thermodynamics. Delta E is Q minus W. Q is zero. W is zero. So delta E is zero. If delta E is zero, remember what we saw today, delta E internal for an ideal gas is NCV delta T. So if delta, T, delta E is zero, then delta T is zero. That means this expansion occurs without a change in temperature. But definitely there is a change in pressure and volume. Okay, there is a change in pressure and volume, but the temperature will not change. So that brings us to the end of the chapter and at the end as you can see in the textbook we have this very nice table that summarizes the four important processes that we usually encounter with ideal gases. For all these processes you can always use the first law of thermodynamics which will be true for any material. Delta E internal is Q minus W. For the ideal gases we have seen today that delta internal is NCV delta T, which will apply for any process that equation will be the same. Q is calculated by NCX, C now depends on what process you are considering, multiplied by delta T. Let's now consider the four processes that we can have, and these are the corresponding PV diagrams. In the isobaric process, the pressure is constant, that is this one here, the green line. So what can we say here? <clears throat> Nothing is zero here. Q is NCP delta T, W is P delta V, and delta E internal is NCV delta T. In the isothermal process, the temperature is constant. Okay, if the temperature is constant, delta T is zero, delta E internal is zero, if delta E internal is zero, then Q is equal to W, and W, as we saw in the first lecture in this chapter, for an isothermal process, is NRT ln of V final over V initial. Where is that here? That is this red line here. It goes on an isotherm. The third process is the adiabatic process. That's what we discussed here. Now, P is not constant, V is not constant, T is not constant, but this particular product, PV to the gamma, is constant. In the adiabatic process, Q is zero. If Q is zero, then W is equal to minus delta E internal, which is equal to that. And where is the adiabatic process? It is this steep, dark green line. Finally, in the isochoric process, the volume is constant. If the volume is constant, the work is zero and Q will be equal to delta internal, which is NCV delta T. That process is this straight vertical line here, number four. A very nice collection of all the processes. Let's now look at some uh, examples and problems related to various processes in ideal gases. And we start with this checkpoint from the textbook. The check point four says the figure shows five paths, okay? One, two, three, uh, four, and five traversed by a gas on a PV diagram. Rank the paths according to the change in the internal energy of the gas. Well, the change in the internal energy of the gas for any process, delta E internal is equal to NCV delta T. 
well, n is the number of moles constant, Cv is constant, we are talking about a particular gas, could be monatomic, could be diatomic, whatever it is, once we know the gas, that is constant. So what will change is delta T. Let's see the process, okay? And let's see delta T for that process. If I talk, if I, uh, let, let's say the path instead of the process, if I look at path one, what is delta T? The final temperature is here, here is path one, initial, final. Final is T2, initial is T1. So T2 minus T1. For path two, there is path two, okay? This is the initial, T1, the final is T2. So T2 minus T1. For path three, where is three? Here is three, two step, but we don't care about the steps, only initial and final. Initial is T1, final is T2. So again, it is T2 minus T1. For path number four, here is path number four. This is the initial, and that is the final. Again, we only care about initial and final. Initial is T1, final is T2. So T2 minus T1. Finally, path number five. What do we have? Here is path number five. This is the initial point, T1. <laughs> And the final point is that one there, which is T3 now, T3. So what is the ranking? 1, 2, 3, 4 are all equal. Path 5 is different and it is more, you can see the difference there. It is more than the other three paths. So the ranking will be 5, then 1, 2, 3, 4, tie. Okay. Next, let us look at this sample problem from the textbook, which says a bubble of five moles of helium, like a balloon containing five moles of helium, is submerged at a certain depth in liquid water when the water undergoes a temperature increase of 20 degrees Celsius degrees at constant pressure. So we have helium, a monatomic gas, helium is in that column in the periodic table, the last column, so it is a monatomic gas. We have five moles in helium, uh, five moles of helium. They undergo a change or an increase of temperature by 20 degrees, and that occurs at constant pressure, isobaric process. As a result, the bubble expands uh, because of that. Helium is monoatomic and ideal. Now let's see what we are requested to calculate here. <clears throat> Part A says, so let's first write what we know about helium and what is given in the problem. What we are told in the problem is the following. We are given that N is equal to 5, delta T is 20K. Remember in chapter 18, the first lecture, a change in the Celsius scale is the same as a change in the Kelvin scale. So the increase, this is a change now, the increase is 20 Celsius degrees, that will be the same on the Kelvin scale. Cv, since helium is monoatomic, Cv is 3R over 2, as we saw today, and Cp is R plus this 5R over 2. Part A. How much energy is added as heat? What is Q? Well, this is an isobaric process, so it is NCP, constant pressure. CP multiplied by delta T. Okay? We have N. CP is there. Delta T is there. Put in the numbers, you will find that this is 2.08 kilojoules. Part B, what is the change in the internal energy of helium? Well, the internal energy, the change in the internal energy for an ideal gas, for any process, is equal to NCV delta T. 
watch CV for any process. Delta E goes with CV. Here is M, here is CV, there is delta T, put in there, and that will be 1.25 kilojoules. Finally, the problem says, how much work is done by helium as it expands against the pressure of the surrounding water? Well, one way to calculate the work is to use the Ferris law thermodynamics. Work is Q minus delta E internal, so it's 2.08 minus 1.25, and that is 0.83 kilojoules. Or, for this particular process, we know that W is equal to P times delta V. As we saw by the chain rule of calculus, this is equal to NR times delta T. N is 5, we know it is R, delta T is 20. If you plug in the numbers, you will again have 0.83 as we obtained from the first law of thermodynamics. Beyond this, let's discuss one more problem from the textbook, which is about the, uh, which is about the, uh, the adiabatic process. <coughs> And this is then from the textbook. <clears throat> it's about an adiabatic process in an ideal gas. <clears throat> a certain gas occupies a volume of 0 0.76 liters. Okay, so we have the initial volume is 0 0.76 liters at the pressure of 1.2 atmospheres, P initial is 1.2 atmospheres, and a temperature of 4,000 K. T initial is 4,000 K. It expands adiabatically, here is the process, adiabatically to a final volume of V final 4.3 Liters. Assuming the gas to be an ideal gas for which gamma is 1.4, just put the side, okay? Do we remember what is, which, which gas has gamma 1.4? It's the diatomic gas. Go back to the table we had. 1.4 corresponds to a diatomic gas. This is just something we keep on the side. Determine the final pressure of the gas. Well, for that, we use the equation that connects pressure and volume. P initial, V initial to the gamma is equal to P final, V final to the gamma. We want this one. P final is equal to V initial over V final to the gamma. I brought this here, and I still have P initial. Now put the numbers. V initial is 0.76. V final, 4.3. I don't have to change the units because liters will cancel. Gamma is 1.4 multiplied by P initial, which is 1.2 atmospheres. If I keep it as atmospheres, I will get the answer in atmospheres. And doing so will give me 0 0.106 atmospheres. So there is a decrease of pressure because this is expansion. Find the final temperature. Well, now we have, we use the equation between T and V. As we saw in our discussion, the equation says T initial, V initial to the gamma minus one is equal to T final, V final to the gamma minus one. So T final is equal to V initial over V final to the gamma minus one multiplied by T initial and that will be equal to V initial 0.76 over 4.3 to the power gamma 1.4 minus 1.4 multiplied by 
4,000. And you have to know how to find these numbers using your calculator. That would be equal to 2,000 K. So the temperature decreases. This is adiabatic cooling. Now, before we move, this is a point that I cannot pass. Try. Okay, this is a mistake. I want you to do this mistake to learn from it. Suppose that you say, okay, let me do it in degrees C. What is T initial? T initial is 4000 K. How much is that in degrees Celsius? That is 3727 degrees C. Now put that here and see what you will get. And what you get converted to Kelvin. You will not get 2000. You will get 2136 Kelvin, which is absolutely incorrect. And that's because, as I stressed from the beginning of this chapter, forget about Celsius degrees in chapter 19 with the gases. You must, you must, you must work with degrees Kelvin. This is just an illustration of that uh, mistake. Okay, this is the problem as it appears in the book. Now let me add to it to make it comprehensive and complete. Here is my addition to the problem in the book. Let's calculate the work done in this process and the change in the internal energy of the gas in this process. Starting with the last one, okay, I will do the internal energy. You will see that they are the same, okay? If we start from the first law of thermodynamics, this is a diabetic process, Q0, the first law of thermodynamics says delta E internal is Q minus W. This is zero. So for this process, delta E internal is equal to minus W. They are the negative of each other. How do we calculate delta E internal for any process and for any ideal gas? Delta E internal is NCV delta T. We have to know CV. How do we know CV? Well, from looking at gamma. Gamma 1.4 corresponds to a diatomic gas. Gamma equal to 1.4 means we are dealing with a diatomic gas. If it is a diatomic gas, CV is 5R over 2. Remember, it's 3R over 2, but we have rotation and vibration, so 5R over 2. That is CV. So, delta E internal for any process, for any gas, is NCV times delta T. In this case, this will be N times 5R over 2 times delta T. Let's put the numbers. Ah, we need to find N. Where is N? Well, again, we go to our friend. It should be there on the side, sitting for our help throughout this chapter, which is the ideal gas law. Here is the ideal gas law. PV is equal to NRT. So N is equal to PV over RT. If you use final, so be it. If you use initial, initial. Let's use the initial values. This would be equal to... Uh, how much is P initial? Now we have to use SI units. 1.2, change it to Pascal, times V initial, 4.3, okay, it change it to meter cubed, times 10 to the minus 3, over 8.31, times T initial, it's already in Kelvin, 4,000. So that will give us the number of moles is equal to 2.77 times 10 to the minus 3. This is N. Okay? So now I can calculate what is delta E. Delta E internal is equal to N 2.77 10 to the minus 3 times 5 over 2 times R 8.31 times delta T. T final 2000. T initial, 4,000. So, this will give me a value of minus, because of this, 115 joules.
that is the change of the internal energy of the gas in this process. So what is the work? The work is the negative of the internal energy. W is equal to plus 115 joules. Plus means we have expansion logically. That is what is happening here. The gas is expanding. So definitely the work done will be positive. And that brings us to the end of our chapter 19, which was discussed completely to gases. And we have to see seen how to describe them and how to describe the various processes associated with them. Okay, here is the derivation for the equation that relates the pressure and volume in an adiabatic process.